The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. I would like to structure this talk um, with a short introduction. I would like to begin with a short introduction concerning photographic uh, issues uh, um, related to the turn from analog to digital photography. And then further on, I would like uh, to show a few examples of that, which you can see in original in the exhibition at the Tufts University Art Gallery. And after that, I would like to uh, go further to the questions of public space to uh, show a few exp examples of projects I have been doing in public media space, which is maybe an important uh, distinction. Um, to begin with, I would like to uh, state a quote of the German uh, philosopher Günther Anders, who um, very precisely uh, thought about the tools we are using when he said, we are inverted utopians. While utopians cannot produce what they imagine, we cannot imagine what we produce. This sentence from Günther Anders paraphrases in an unusual way our relation to the tools which, like processes, are supposed to change and expand our physical possibilities and allow us a more complex treatment of the world's phenomena. It is not the immediate view of the world that sets off the discourses. Rather, it is a medial, apparatively oriented view that supplies us with the image products, which present us not only with qualitative, but also quantitative challenges. The immediacy of information, the result of the delegation of our perception activities into the realm of apparatuses, and mass media systems has not only led us to new discoveries, enabling the sciences to experience a de developmental thrust, rather it has also created a meta-universe which poses new problems due to its broad spectrum of possibilities and above all, its context-related variants. One of these tools which have been metaphorically addressed by Günther Anders, photography, is part of and the foundation for today's image machines, which currently focus our views and have subjected us to another way of seeing things. Photography, today situated in a multimedial context, was in its history product and driving force in the industrialization of the 19th century and was subject to a number of revolutionary changes which until recently belonged to a so-called analog translation process. The digitalization of recognition procedures that has been occurring for several years now has again brought up old questions regarding information acquisition within this discipline as well. Above all, however, the opening of its analog boundaries has cleared the way into a larger image universe which in docking to other digitalized realms of the visual on the level of the standardizing numeric code now takes place on a more abstract but also more trouble-free platform. Even before this medium gained shape, our perception was supported already by many means which could be called screens. Yes, one could say that even the process of seeing itself is based on a screen-based situation where the light beams concentrate on the retina, our personal inner screen. The entire history of the central perspective is based on the development of screens on all the helpful apparatuses which had been constructed since the Renaissance period to make proportions and measurements easier in drawing and painting or the use of projections by candlelight onto screens to achieve a more accurate image being still depicted by hand. Mentioning all these incredible devices would go far beyond the possibilities of this talk, of course, but at the end, they all were preconditions for the machines which ended finally in the medium of photography. From the very beginning, the medium had been a screen-based medium where rays of light fall through an aperture, later a lens onto a chemical carrier, um, which produced immediately the image or later the negative. At the beginning, the record level was also the viewfinder at the same time, which turned into a second screen later on and which was extremely useful to prepare the exposure. 
Roland Barthes came to the conclusion that the authenticity of photography preserves at least a few genuine remnants at the moment of taking, is its most important distinguishing character and at the same time the main difference to other media. However, since the turnover by digital processes, this statement seems to be historical. Yes, one could say it has always been like that because of all, all the many factors, even the analog process, never allowed real neutral conditions. The variability in the area of analog photographic work is far from the information passing directly into the printed image. But if we disregard for a moment the further possibilities of altering the data record of a digital photograph acquired in this way, high quality digital equipment apparently supplies us with a computed image with the highest density, pure and without grain. In the digital mode, the production of the image and its possible variation take place on the same level. This comparison shows us that at least until the negative or the data record has been produced, the different translation logics qualitatively can only be played off against each other with difficulty. The decisive point of their difference lies in the area of recording and furthermore the handling of negatives or data records, which in the digital can open up new spaces and close old ones due to their compatibility with other data records their variability and fragility, but above all, the inability to detect possible image alteration strategies. Indeed, I would even say that this discussion also makes us aware of the instability of analog space as an auxiliary construction, a simulation, more interpretation and construction than documentation or deconstruction. Manipulative, manipulative strategies are above all also possible in the area of the distribution context. In media systems, the fractures occur primarily there where embedded journalists administer us reasonable doses of not only war reports. Enlightened media consumption today as the basis for judging all conveyed information takes for granted that this arises from the context of embedded reporting regardless of whether the facts spring from political, economic, like corporate or stock market reports, <clears throat> for instance, or cultural, industrial contexts. The contextual assignment of meaning is not a result of a digital image culture, rather it has been a decisive question as long as there have been pictorial creations. But marketing and public relations methods have penetrated so far into reporting or are applied in such a stilted way in advertising that clear recognition is often not possible, nor is it desired. Photographs, and maybe just to mention uh, uh, one example, there was a recent study about the situation in Germany, where in the meantime about 30,000 political journalists, or journalists writing about economic aspects, are opposed by about 18,000 marketing specialists, which shows that the classical, the classic form of journalism is actually fading away. And uh, the survey says also that the situation in the United States is even the other way around, where the majority uh, of reports you can, can be traced back to marketing uh, sources and not to the classic form of journalism anymore. About 40% of all the information coming let's say, to magazines, do have this particular background in the meantime and are not based on research uh, of individuals like we were used to get it uh, in mass media maybe until a couple of years ago. Photographs, analog as well as digital, operate with realistic, naturalistic, figurative elements, but their exact reference to reality is not revealed. I would like to call to mind the famous speech made by the American Secretary of State, Colin Powell, before the United Nations Security Council in New York, in which by using photographs from, of some vehicles in a desert environment, he wanted to prove the existence of weapons of mass destruction and the necessity for war against Iraq. Within the framework of this presentation, it was completely irrelevant whether the images shown were of an analog or digital nature, 
It was much more important that this information was transmitted to us via screens, which are not capable to tell us the real image qualities after all. And there would be many other examples, of course. <clears throat> the complete relativity of a single pixel is a new quality and en enables penetrating deeper into images. In the end, we are faced with a paradox. The greater resolution density, data volume, and detail accuracy of digital photography stand in the way of a higher degree of abstraction and greater scope of variation. Another kind of description creates another difference. <clears throat> Nevertheless, I think a documentary approach within digital photography is still possible because one talks usually only about the alteration possibilities but always forgets that these methods are possibilities but not definite needs to apply on images. Beyond that, I find it more appropriate to relate to the term of documentation more in that sense how it has been used in film theory, for instance, where the individual approach and the technology never had hindered to document at all. Information has come under particular pressure since it has become a commodity and thus of commercial economic interest. From this we can conclude that we have no choice but to develop a special competence to adequately describe and decipher these production and interpre interpretation processes. Measured against the necessity of interacting with the world with the aid of machines, the urgency of meticulously observing and describing these tools is in any case great. In a time of narcissistic concentration on one's own reflection in the media, it is important that the self-reflexive eye does not become blind and that the technologies function within the framework of a transparent test arrangement. More than ever, the degree of transparency, trust and skepticism constitute the changing basis for the reliability of the information or whether one allows a document to be just that. Little quotes, and um, I will come to the first works. The one work you saw before, uh, I will be talking about a little bit later. Ludwig Wittgenstein once stated, it cannot be discovered from the picture alone whether it is true or false. Sources, the works you see here, the first group, uh, which I would like to show is from 1993, deals with the situation that a large share of our information is no longer accessible to direct experience. The current trade with images in the media world consists simultaneously of the most varied formal and technical expressions for the most part interconnected and producing transmedia phenomena, mixtures of the most varied image-wise transport tracks, where it has mostly become impossible to look through at an underlying source. The question arises of whether the crossing of many thresholds of this kind does not, to a certain degree, change the disposition of these images with regard to content and whether in the extreme case the image's reference is close to zero. The apparatus contains both the user's interests and strategies in their varied forms of application, as well as the general conditions of the developers that have been transformed into technology. This is the gist of how William Flusser sees it, for example. Thus, from the perspective of a common view, <clears throat> Excuse me. of the different forms of mass media expression, what is required is a kind of media deconstructivism which peels off the surfaces to reveal structural preconditions, the apparatus levels of the production of difference. The works show a shedding of complex visual systems, which in everyday use are entangled rhizome-like and which overlap. Extreme enlargements from visual mass media, both moving and still, such as computer prints, photocopies, computer and television monitors, different print media and so on, show the microscopic structures, indeed the handwriting of media images, one normally does not always see. One sees microscopic details from media images that no longer refer to the representation of the transported content but rather demonstrate the formal structure of the transport tracks itself. The emergence of the media technical apparatus 
makes it clear that everything it represents is affected by it. The sources are documentary, indeed scientific photographs that show internal construction principles and address conditions of representation. It is a kind of media archaeology behind the narrative strategies. The images look like paintings, speak of new media, and yet they are photographs. Reproductions, I would like to stress, that lie on the extremely narrow boundary between representational and abstract, which in the end shows that these kinds of categories may have become obsolete, maybe. When I'm photographed, I feel like a hostage. I immediately pretend to be dead. This comes from Jean Baudrillard a couple of years ago. The next group of works I would like to address is called Exposures. It's from 2002, a work that on the one hand has very much to do with the executive medium itself. Exposure is a central photographic and cinematic term. On the other hand, it concerns components of a media society that are sometimes voluntarily, often also involuntarily, at the mercy of media apparatuses. The machines, which besides the actual recording apparatus are of great importance, here are those of media light, which at certain moments constitute the basic requirements for being able to produce a media image. The lamps place us in a position in which we are unquestionably at the mercy of the person operating them, therefore exposed. The wall separating public and private has become permeable. What also belongs to the active part of media existence is that we operate in a society in which media self-confidence is becoming normal. Wherever a television camera or a microphone turns up today, people crowd around them. The public grin, the affected theatri theatrical behavior, the posing, as Craig Owens calls it, the staging have become a collective method of conferring identity. On the other hand, if someone in the midst of a nasty argument in front of millions of television viewers no longer understands the instrumentalization of his or her misery, then the private sphere has been wiped out. Viewed in this way, the public sphere has become a giant stage for private fantasies that can be easily blown up by the media into something scandalous, although or precisely because they depict everyday dreariness. For celebrities who get caught in the gears of gossip journalism, it is also a case of the difficult interplay between the user and the person being used. The passive form is to be found in paparazzidom, where people are literally hunted down with the camera and shot. Exposures attempts to address the ambiguity of being exposed, which is ever more determining our relation to media. In other words, Bruce Nauman's die of exposure turned into die for exposure. Artificial sources of light, which come from the area of amateur videography as well as the field of professional studio lighting, therefore our artificial suns are the subject of this work. To me it seems like an interesting opportunity also being able to direct apparatuses which arose from scientific thought at each other. They allow us to take up perspectives with the third eye otherwise not available to us. In exposures, it is this specific photographic apparatus that enables us to look into a full-powered flash in the first place, for without this auxiliary eye, we would not tolerate looking into the light, but go blind instead. Screens Called, a series of work I have been doing between 1997 and uh, 2003, another photographic work I would like to address, deals with monitors, the screens, with electronic displays in the broadest sense in the way Jean-Luc Godard manifestly distinguishes them from the cinema screen. In the cinema, the viewer is attracted by the image. In television, the viewer is projected by the image, like he stated. There is hardly an area of life free of screens of a whole variety of makes and sizes. From the cell phone to the widescreen 16 to 9 television, the screen has become the window of our society. 
the visual display is becoming the global substitute for seeing the favored logical principle of information. Media filters, such as fluorescent screens, are at the same time funnels and megaphones. These machines were photographed in such a way that because they were in a cold state, they were able to reveal their surfaces. The transparent screen surfaces of these windows interfaces between few and what is being represented generally disappear when the equipment is activated. As practiced users of these technologies, we have lost the knowledge that all of our movements of this kind are only borrowed movements. Only when there is an interference in the media drum fire does this matter, of course, collapse like a house of cards, brutally throwing our desires back onto ourselves. The loss of the picture makes us aware of the naked medium, the emptiness, the break, which owing to a general state of chattering, we are no longer able to endure. In contrast, a switched off screen refers to a vast amount of invisible things not being exposed at that moment. The screen becomes a non-active and projection surface that carries the potenti potentiality of a hot filling. Screens cold, like the title of this work is, are works in which one sees that one sees nothing at the moment. One may see that one sees nothing, but one also sees something one otherwise does not see. On the one hand, the referential readability is made more extreme because due to the digital scanner camera principle, with a long exposure time as in early photography, which I have been using here, and highest resolutions, an individual image is produced whose detail information is superior to the analog photograph, which again brings up old issues of documentary principles. On the other hand, of course, a photograph of this detail and this formal organization says something about the abstract, the reduced, but the indexicality is preserved. What interests me about these structures is precisely the border between abstraction and concrete, realistic representation, the optical illusion between high resolution, documentary photography, and painterly aesthetics. <clears throat> and I have to add here that uh, it is quite difficult to transmit the detail quality of these very large-scale photographs uh, because this is just not transmittable via projection and um, therefore I just can uh, recommend to have a look at the originals. Stand by another work speaking directly about the monitor is an attempt to show aspects of this machine which is in an in-between state of being, not really turned on and not really turned off. Using regular photographic means, it would have been impossible to show the specific qualities of this particular condition of a monitor. Therefore, I needed to switch over to a distinct scientific appliance, a thermographic camera system, which displays the, the warmth, the higher temperature, than being turned off. Standby is a special state of waiting with low energy, but with the accurate possibility to be turned on without delay. Yes, looking at the device without the use of another apparatus would not make it clear at all what is going on with that machine, because it seems to sleep and being blind. What you see here is a thermographic image of a television monitor in standby modus. Because in confrontation with many digital and technological procedures, we are not able anymore to detect what is going on by just looking at the surface of objects or from outside. Therefore, we need to grasp specific moments sometimes of, of being or look at them where they are distant from common use to achieve moments of the usual invisible, the, the abstract. This uh, finally brings me to the questions of uh, public space. And um, I would like to state a few general uh, comments before I show the actual projects then. Technical images cover all of the niches of our present by means of television. 
the internet, the newspaper, direct mail advertising, or the giant billboards, we are supplied with the relevant calls at every corner. And are no longer left alone for even a moment. The original intent of propagating information, once argued, has become an advertising dictatorship, the mother of all battles for the consumer. Media bait, as has become the usual thing in the economy or the entertainment departments of information systems, the game, the quiz, the contest, is a form of what has become the everyday rehearsal of narrative advertising and sales strategies, and thus a kind of media fitness training. In the case of an excess of information, meaning and context are the decisive factors. Interactivity and feedback, then, mean collaborating on a story, on an image, so that in the end consumers voluntarily adorn themselves with logos and demonstrate their agreement with the corporate philosophy. An unbelievable need for stories arises. Although subjects transform themselves and visibly dissolve, the eye share and self-marketing become a survival strategy in the form of telepresence, and we all become publishers of new stories. It is the era of total publication. The short life of the information and the resulting uncertainty are diametrically opposed to a fashionable word that is used in an inflationary way in the media discourse, the creation of sustainability. Roland Barthes remarked that the bastardized form of mass culture is a disgraceful repetition. The contents, the ideological schemes, the erasure of contradictions repeat themselves constantly. The forms on the surface vary. The economization of life and our attention creates a connection to function via a series of product and price which reaches a narrative climax in the advertising strategies where the following applies. Story before product. The product has become unthinkable without the narrative context, whose purchase leads to a happy ending at long last. Advertising psychologists apply the available scientific insight from empirical field data to subliminal messages to achieve profit. And I do remind here um, of... Um, some uh, personalities which do also have links to Austria. Um, the one is Ernest Dichter, who was a major figure in the, um, the new field of um, motivation research. And uh, he had an extreme strong influence on the advertising and the psychology which is involved in it. And the other one was uh, Edward Bernays, um, who was a nephew of Sigmund, Sigmund Freud, and he wrote major books about propaganda and mass manipulation. The power consists in the repetition at the disposal of the strategies and which can be bought by the strength of capital. These dramatic connections continue smoothly over into the malls, the temples of consumption, where every absurdity is raised to the status of an event. But where one thing, however, is always the focus, the conveying of passive obedience. One finds an interesting indication of this, in this regard, comparable with the content of many mass media on the packaging of a fast food chain. At Burger King, you can expect a delicious meal as individual as you are. Program content is being increasingly projected as scenery that supplies the appropriate stage set for the advertising economy. A consistent leveling of the boundaries between editorial parts and advertising through product placements or so-called advertorials or through appearances by television news celebrities in commercials and in politics, which are frequently shown directly before or after the regular broadcasts only to cite a few examples, reduces the different information qualities to a common level and also makes principal conflicts of interest apparent. Catastrophes or the values of the tabloid press and dime novels such as prominent beauty, fate, family happiness or wealth supply the mythic and voyeuristic game rules in the competition of self-representation. 
Yet, as they are filtered through many interests, only partial aspects of our life become visible here. What is involved is a largely blind mirror of our existence. The pact with a hunger for sensation has led to the point where this form of constructed reality is more interesting and exciting than real life. Crime and accidents in real time, disasters online. That is the, the thrill that generates intoxication and serves addiction. The more that real death disappears from a youth-crazed society, the more vehemently death occurs in mass media space. We expect an unconditional availability of the real via the roundabout path of the media, although this strategy is curiously adopted at the same time, which blocks a differentiated access to the world by means of mass media. The plan of a terror attack was also carried out in the knowledge of these processes. The media chain reaction, triggered by the lethal fireworks of 9-11, turned it into the absolute world event. It is actually the intimate knowledge of this phenomenon also that generates these kinds of mad ideas because a large portion of the media networks have chosen the disaster as sensation as the primary building block of their existence. The fatal tendency to press any kind of information into a corset of scandals represses, analyzes and precise research. In fact, any differentiated discussion. We have become a society of the spectacle, as Guy de Boer already characteristically noted many years ago. The battle of good against evil is one result of this kind of abbreviation and an example of a narrative dispositive that includes, represented by a media-appropriate slogan, the promise of the spectacle. But that is a different story. But it is above all the area with demand character, advertising, that is courting us in ever more subtle strategies and in an increasing number of variations. The boundaries between advertising as information and marketing and manipulation, as well as between politics and propaganda, have proven to have become more permeable. In fact, it is a schizophrenic situation with television, for example, being an information medium and an advertising medium at the same time. And curiously enough, our democratic countries, which were originally able to develop into these constructions with the aid of a different use of mass media systems, which, for example, excluded one-sided economic availability, that, um, that have recently come under pressure again. <clears throat> I've been developing a group of works called Who's Afraid of Blue, Red and Green since the early 1990s and it has found expression in various media, but especially in intervention in public space and public media space. The point of departure of this body of work was the enlarged aperture grill of a color monitor based on an apparative eye. The title, Who's Afraid of Blue, Red and Green, is a variation on Barnett Newman's famous Who's Afraid of Red, Red, Yellow and Blue from the late 1960s, whose four-part series of paintings made reference to the primary color system of painting in a radical and self-reflexive way at a time when painting appeared to be driven to an end in the history of modernism by the prevailing developments in art. Due to the shifting of the primary color system away from painting and towards the principle of different mass media, the thought background into which the works of Who's Afraid of Blue, Red and Green are to be placed, placed has changed. And I'll just uh, show very quickly a few directions of uh, this work. There's a one, on the one hand a body of work which uh, goes more into the direction of painting because what you see here is looks like a photograph but it actually is a, a, a critic glass container which is filled with pure color pigments, the basic material of painting, but at the end it is done very carefully and precisely that it almost uh, uh, relates to a photographic view. Uh, this is another example picking up the form of statistics which is a very common way to display information in mass media, all kind of uh, information. This is one view from the exhibition now at Tufts Gallery where you see one photographic triptych of the 
body of work, Who's Afraid of Blue, Red and Green, which shows three photographs from flat screens where um, the primary colors are exclusively divided into each one, which means um, on one photograph you just see a screen with the pure blue pixels lit up and the others with red and green. Usually if you display a monochromatic surface on a screen, of course it is mixed by all three colors and you would see in a close-up view all these three different colors, but with a particular software it is possible to just exclusively show one of these three colors. And here you can see a little bit the detailed information of uh, his digital photographs. But this brings me to uh, finally to works in public space. This is one example of uh, uh, permanent work in Austria where uh, a glass facade was covered with uh, another facade of uh, perforated aluminium sheets which are painted on both sides with this primary color system which means when you are inside and here you have the view and walk up to this um, uh, glass facade that the image starts to flare and move like a media image. Another example is a project I did in Belgium uh, last year where it was possible to use uh, the billboard stands of a political party in a town there and it gave me the possibility to set up uh, about 20 groups of three billboard stands each throughout the whole town. Um, a very minimal approach which caused a big discussion in fact because people were that much irritated because they didn't know if maybe elections were coming up so they called the mayor's office and asked what is going on here and um, um, as a matter of fact uh, uh, I liked it very much that it was possible to generate this uncertainty uh, by a very simple method at the end. Yes. Yeah. I think here it is basically blue and red, yeah. and we have many more. Yeah. Um, this uh, is a, uh, an example, for instance, of a project I did in Shanghai two years ago, where there was the possibility to use a billboard um, uh, space on the roof of a, a factory building which was facing to one of the major highways in Shanghai going through the city and um, which was uh, also very interesting for me because if you come to Shanghai now, nowadays uh, you will see that the whole city is covered with advertising everywhere, almost everywhere, entire facades completely uh, covered with billboards and in this region there was still nothing else going on so it was very nice to be able to use this space exclusively there and um, uh, I was using the title and a close-up photograph of a TV screen as well in this combination you can see here. Um, another application in another form of uh, public space was an intervention in a German art magazine where I was using the word embedded throughout a four page insert. This was the double page and the fourth page. And this brings me over now to the currently running public art project in Boston where I decided to rent a truck and trailer which is covered with two huge billboards on each side, the same one based on the close-up photograph of the white text of the word embedded uh, taken from a computer screen so that because of this close-up the white text falls apart in the primary colors. The word itself is much more um, interesting in a self-reflexive way I think because it is applicable on every kind of media information which is transmitted. It's not just this contemporary, very political connotation most people probably think of. Um, it is much more uh, the general situation, what is happening to contents within the media environment. Everything 
is embedded in the technological and strategic context. context. So we just started the project on Friday, so you probably will see this truck driving around in the next weeks and maybe being parked in certain areas. Um, just moving it over from the trailer yard to uh, Tufts University campus where it is at the moment before it will be moved the next time um, was very interesting already to see that people are not used to get information in advertising areas um, which they can relate to immediately. So it raises probably a basic question also. What is going on here? Who, who is uh, taking the public space? Usually it's used for clear uh, messages uh, of sales strategies. And um, well, uh, then I would like to speak a little bit more about one uh, part of another project which I did uh, in New York two years ago on Times Square and which was based also on interactive strategies. For the shaping of the idea in an internet version, which was online in different preliminary stages already in 1995, I developed a game and a contest intended to initiate a media and creative process with the active inclusion of the public. The aim of the competition was to design a predetermined module online on the computer. The, mon the module consisted of a regular sequence of red, blue and green vertical stripes, like the close-up view onto a computer screen. And participants were asked to develop an animation out of 15 individual frames, you see one of them, that could be run as a loop afterwards. You have to imagine this as a moving image. I will show it to you later. It was required to organize these 15 individual windows in the order of the vertical stripes in such a way that an animation was produced for a large-scale monitor projection for which each of the vertical lines could be set to either red, blue or green. The large number of theoretically possible variations provided enough leeway for individual designs. After processing the 15 frames, an animation was automatically produced by clicking the mouse and the users could either reject the animation or place it in a designated gallery. This gallery was always accessible to anyone interested and constituted the reservoir from which three winners were ultimately chosen, whose animations were shown for four months on the Times Square AstroVision screen, always at the last minute of every full hour. After the deadline for submissions had passed, using a specially designed web interface, a 10-member jury made up of artists, curators, and critics from the field of new media assigned points to the contributions and designated three finalists out of approximately 700 submissions from 80 countries we received. This project was, part of, was based on participative methods which brings me back for a moment to another interactive work I did in 1993 in Austria, and um, which was called uh, Find the Difference. And you probably uh, know this game from television magazines. This game is based on a simple puzzle that frequently appeared in European print media, and um, especially in the 60s and 70s, but they still do exist. And, uh, in the Spot the Differences game, one is asked to compare an original image with one that includes mistakes and to define the differences. These kind of picture puzzles used to be drawn by hand. Nowadays, they mostly consist of photographs that have been digitally altered. It seemed to me that this popular puzzle was the right simple metaphor for reception in connection with mass media. And so I decided to transfer it from the printed medium into a landscape setting where the public would be requested to interact. It was possible to work with the mass medium of television and this led to a project that would otherwise correspond to the logistics of an advertising agency. There was an accompanying media campaign with commercials before the main evening news and clear instructions for a game with a chance of winning various prizes to be drawn on television when the game was over. The game and the accompanying contest consisted of participating in a media process in the sense of a joint looking, examining and documenting. 
Despite the rather short playing period for a contest, two and a half weeks, thousands of people visited the five locations, many of them actually participating in the picture puzzle game by filling out the contestant card. And the large number of participants, however, was ambivalent. Because this efficiency was satisfactory in the sense of an artistic project, but also illuminating in the sense of its social significance for messages that are disseminated through the most important mass media. In the Find the Difference project was still the real landscape the target besides the media image. In Who's Afraid of Blue, Red and Green, I placed the stopping medium and the final representation medium, the monitor, at the center of the examination. This was important both for the individual users in their work at their screens as well as for the presentation level on the screen on Times Square. A condition for participating, just a moment, um, in the contest was a joint design process that may not have been dealt with three, with three clicks of the mouse, but did not, however, require financial clout. It was guaranteed that the winning entries would be presented at this location for several months, whose concentrated attention was normally sold for a large amount of money. The much-cited media democracy is primarily characterized by the fact that it makes self-reflection possible. As soon I'm sorry, it's not running at the right speed. Something, it's probably the external hard drive. Well, usually it runs smoothly, of course. <clears throat> in this media universe, plurality, independence, and comprehensible research are the guarantee that the different ways of viewing things can get through and the consumers can paint a many-sided picture of the reported phenomena. Commercial and political instrumentalization showed themselves in the preparations for the war in Iraq in a way that was as disturbing as the sorrowful history of Italian democracy, to name another example, where Silvio Berlusconi, since he first took office, an excellent case study has been taking place. This demonstrates, in an alarming way, how far the principle of media communication and public action have been able to be privatized and sabotaged in a democracy by now, the US media, uh, for instance, world is basically under control of five media companies. And uh, each one belongs to the biggest companies of the world. And we can speak of a monopoly, indeed, because these companies are beyond that also interlinked with each other to various boards and uh, uh, common projects they do together. And, um, they do actually perform a pseudo-concurrency. Um, this surplus of concrete, real, is dissolving reality into simulations. The hidden, the undefinable, is increasing, and thus the abstract of a mass media society is being assembled behind this jungle of stories, this realm that eludes direct perception. Reference is not primarily being made to what is, re is being reported to on, which for us is being presented in an increasingly abstract way because we no longer have direct access to it. The real in the spirit of Baudrillard, or to the why, which is becoming increasingly indiso indissoluble and determines our lemming-like march into hypertrophy. Reference is above all being made to by what means and how the technologies and apparatuses and their strategic occupation. And it is less the metaphysical element that is of interest than processing the factual. If the design of machines no longer reveals anything definite about their usefulness and the processes of digitalization take place in obscurity. One could exaggerate and say that in the meantime we are acting from a different perspective. For us, Media are not the abstract experiences that hide the real. Rather, the media surfaces juggle the real and prevent our looking through to the abstract. Like Edward Bernays said, we do not deal with images, but with reality. Thank you very much.
<laughs> yes? Well, definitely it is not within the classic uh, photographic frame um, because um, I would say to position oneself um, within the abstract uh, approach, if I can call it like that, it sh is almost a contradiction to photographic uh, methods because for the photography is a narrative medium and I'm interested in this thin boundary um, where it turns into something abstract but it's still readable as a photographic image. But um, also because photography itself is an abstracting medium, it is in the best case a simulation or a model, uh, it is, has a certain reference to reality but it is not really that easy to determine in details how it is, especially in the digital uh, period now where everything is uh, well, not reliable anymore in that sense. But not to forget that uh, also the analog photography was a construction. It's very important to, to, to remember that because at the beginning of this discussion between analog and digital photography, there was always um, um, this reminiscence to analog photography that it was more reliable than digital photography. I don't really think that uh, is the case. So on the one hand, I'm interested in that medium where I still think even that it is digitally working nowadays, that it can be used for documentation. This is one uh, approach I like to, um, to have since uh, many years, that um, there is almost a, a scientific approach to, to drive documentary methods up to a technology, technological limit and also to a visual limit because using this particular technology for uh, documenting, let's say, a surface of a cold screen um, is kind of technologically, technologically said state of the art. So you cannot um, exceed um, the image resolution anymore. It, 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 it takes us to a limit of photography and a limit of seeing also in a way. Um, also to, to make it visible that where the documentation is at its peak, it turns easily around into abstraction at the same time. And um, the other thing is that I try to um, um, develop strategies for the public space, which I try to describe with photographic means in a, in a way that it is, can be seen in the, uh, let's say, traditional museum exhibition context. I'm very much interested to leave that also in certain uh, moments and to um, develop interventions in public space which usually take place in, in spaces which is used uh, by advertising, by, uh, well, whatever kind of uh, 
um, public uh, imagery and um, to question these basic principles um, which can be done also with very minimal means, and I think. And uh, for instance, this example with the uh, billboard stands, um, I like because of the fact that very much because it was really a very simple tension to play down to the primary colors and um, not giving any more information about it. And uh, it was enough to question the role of uh, billboards itself and uh, who is in the position to place it in public space, for instance. Who gives permissions to that? Who is able to do this? Um, because one interesting experience, for instance, was that there is not so much difference between a country like China, where we still have a very strong censorship, and um, maybe not that much anymore within exhibition spaces, but as soon as you go to public space, um, you have all these uh, censorship uh, uh, strategies, of course, uh, because the preparation for this billboard, and this uh, might, from our perspective, even sound strange, was a very difficult one. Uh, because, first of all, uh, I presented uh, uh, this idea, and uh, uh, you have, one has to understand this factory is a cultural uh, center and still working as a factory at the same time. So you have galleries in there, you have artist studios in there, but you have also still uh, a factory. And the factory is owned by private owners and partly by the city of Shanghai. And by these official owners, you had, uh, of course, um, um, the comments uh, what the whole project should be. We had to get the permissions from these people. And I um, had to present several uh, ways uh, to be accepted. First, they did not want to have it with the English language and wanted me to make it in Chinese. Um, and then after they thought a little bit, they came back and said, well, it might be better to do it in English. And uh, which I found nice because I did all, I always wanted it to do in English because it referred to an English title. Um, but it shows that um, as soon as you enter a um, public space, there are many more interests involved. And um, the same question would appear in the United States, to make an example, if you show up at uh, Clear Channel, who are, or let's say Viacom, all these companies who are in charge of the huge billboards here, um, and to, well, confront them, for instance, with the word embedded, I'm sure that this would cause a, a discussion already in the foreground. If they would give me the permission, um, even if an institution would pay for it, it's not guaranteed that you can do that. You, you have to make a fight through that and try to convince people because at the end it is absolutely the same. It is the question, who has the control about public images? Who is in, in charge of giving the permission? It's not only, I mean, in the regular case for commercial use, you can buy the space. But as soon as you're crossing the line into issues which not which are not part of marketing and sales strategies anymore, then I think it is in the same way sensitive to these general questions than in a country like China or, I don't know, Singapore, uh, where it's still almost impossible to do something without an official permission. But at the end, in a totally commercial context, like it is here or in Europe, you have absolutely the same problem. Um, public space is a very important factor and everybody wants to have control over it. It's very simple. Absolutely. 
And I think that there is also uh, one thing to mention. This find the difference game was like a scientific uh, test situation. It would be too simple to play it off like what we see is the real and what we have in a simulated way is the unreal. It's not that easy, of course. But trying to get people to, to, to be involved in such, such a procedure when they see something uh, in, on television in an advertising a TV spot three minutes before the main evening news that forces them to go out into onto the real location do a comparison between the real landscape and an image of the landscape uh, and then at the end seeing televised maybe their participants card where they can win a prize is a very complex procedure at the end it's not that easy that A is A and B is B it is much more complex but the fact was interesting there that they were involved in, a, in the media procedure itself. You know, it's not, it was not just a, a simple uh, comparison between reality and the image of reality. It was much more the procedure that they were asked to move themselves by a, uh, a media, let's say, um, a TV spot, and they did it, they made these small little travels, it was even very far away, this was set up in a circle of 400 kilometers, so it, somebody really had to decide to do it, you know, and, and, and to spend a weekend maybe to go to two or three locations, because this was the precondition to be able to participate, it was not about enough to go to just one location, they had to do at least two. And by doing this and then dropping in the car and so on, it was much more, you know, than, uh, uh, because at the end they saw again the results on TV. So it was sort of a artificial cycle uh, which was drawn by that. And in the best case, they realized that they have been part in this media process. 